to just get us started, so we're going to have a microphone set up over here so people can come up and ask their questions that they have. As people are coming up, one question that I have, listening to everybody, which there's a lot of amazing content that, that you guys were talking about, you know, when, as the governor said, when we're dealing with the fact that this, this city is bought, you know, and that, that our Congress is bought, and we're talking about trying to pass reforms, and we're talking about trying to, to put things in place that are going to keep the money out of politics, but we're dealing with people that are already <laughs> benefiting from the money in politics. What's, what would be a, 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 the first step in kind of starting to build the steps leading up to the point where we start to get things that are, that are passed at that level? Do you understand what I'm saying? Well, I mean, the premise is exactly right. So it's the ultimate challenge for winning money in politics, campaign finance reform, is by definition that people who are there succeeded with the existing system. So even people who rise as reformers, when they get there, well, it's looking pretty good at that moment, and, and they don't want to do reform. And the only answer is bottom up demand. I mean, and it's got to, again, it can't just be broad, because broadly the public is already on board for this. It's got to be really deep, energetic, demanding and in your face pressure from the bottom up. So the entire spirit of Occupy is the spirit of what we need to win serious campaign finance. It's just not going to happen absent that kind of grounds. I think an asset is the age of the internet. Uh, you know, I go to Occupy, I was the only guy that did it, the first one to do it, Wall Street, Washington, New Hampshire, uh, around the country. I go to tea parties. They, they, they don't know it, but they're the same. They smell the same thing. It's called corruption. Uh, they have different means of, of uh, changing it, but they're both valuable. Remember that. We, we've got to get the average American, 98% of all Americans don't give a penny to a campaign. And they sit on the couch and complain about the guys who do. One way to, to, one way to conquer this problem is to entice small business people, real people, workers, members of organizations, communities, to express their love and interest in America with a $5 contribution. We have 130,000 contributors to my campaign. We've raised more than three quarters of a million dollars. It's like $15 a person. It's from every state. No other candidates had that. The closest is Ron Paul. He said 80,000. We report everything. We disclose everything. Now, we've gotten nowhere. We're maybe 5% in the poll. But that's without being on a single national debate. As a Republican for 21 years, the only guy running Congressman Governor was shot out of every debate deliberately. They don't want to talk about the money. I understand that. You know, there was a time when Obama was elected, I had hopes that this issue would move forward. Well, he surrendered. I, I don't mean to be heavy-handed in my criticism. I'd like to be constructive. But when he gave a speech two months ago, well, I've got to take the super PAC money. I don't have a choice. Nonsense. We have members of our cabinet going around raising money for the super PAC. What is America? It's a, I, I had a cab driver a year ago. That's before I gave a speech or anything. I was coming for a meeting with one of these organizations about how do we get this thing going? And I landed in Dulles. I was coming from somewhere to maybe land in Dulles. And I took the 45 minute drive in by taxi. And the taxi driver was from some other country. I won't mention Pakistan by name. <laughs> he is a very decent guy. You know, he didn't know me from Adam's house cat. I was reading the newspaper on the back seat. I didn't say anything. He didn't know what I did. He said, how long are you going to be in town? And finally, after 30 minutes, said something. And I said, well, I'm going to be here two days, and I get back to New Orleans. Oh, and his face got up. New Orleans, I'd love to go. We were talking. I said, you live in the city? He said, I live in the nation's capital. I said, where are you from? He said, Pakistan. I said, what do you think of Washington, D.C.? He said, the most corrupt city 
I mean, Mitt Romney uh, denied for months that he received a million dollar check from a friend in his super PAC. He had received four. He actually spoke to the fundraiser for his own super PAC. I mean, this, and I don't mean to be picking on Mitt, but it's so easy to pick on <laughs> three members did was have a fundraiser from the lobbies. That is criminal in my opinion. Hi, this is a question for Governor Romer. Uh, first off, you're a dynamic speaker. I'm very happy to have someone like you on the national stage talking about this issue so that people who aren't already interested in this issue can get involved. Um, secondly, you had a great chance to bring this issue to the national stage in the debates that you were shut out of. Could you elaborate more on what happened there and perhaps the connection between political corruption and mass media and how to avoid this in the future? Well, I, I tend not to be paranoid and I haven't had the time to know the facts. I know that either I or my campaign managers here Stand up, El Paso. From El Paso, Texas, Carlos Sierra. Uh, we, we, we called each of the debates pre-debate, uh, and we were told a different story. We were told first that I wasn't a formally announced candidate. I went to Dartmouth the next week and announced formally. Why I picked Dartmouth, I don't know, but I had a good time. Uh, okay, you have you like that. Uh, then we were, to, after we qualified, we called for the next debate. You know, there was about one a week. There were 23 nationally televised debates. We called the next week and they said, oh, Governor, we forgot to tell you, you had to have 1% in a national poll. So we worked five weeks. We had no money. We, we had to do it on Good Morning Joe, on Stephen Colbert. We went on all the shows and we got 1%. So we called. They said, oh, uh, Governor, it's 2%. <laughs> so we worked for four weeks, we got 2%, and they call, we called and said, oh, Governor, you had to raise a half a million dollars in the last 90 days. Is that the way you pick a president? I mean, so I got the conclusion that they kind of made up the rules to make sure that no candidate was asked the question, how do you raise your money and what promises do you have to give? In 23 national debates, that was never asked. Um, so, Governor Romer, you mentioned very briefly in your speech, uh, look at a uh, black male with his unemployment rate, but other than that, this, com this conversation that we've been having um, in this conference so far has been almost blindingly white and male, and I was wondering if we could touch on uh, how corporate personhood, how money in politics adversely affects minorities and women, um, and just sort of address that because it's almost been ignored. It's so much a part of the American system that we have to talk about America. I mean, we're a country that's never had a woman as president. How does that happen? You think that's an accident? No. I mean, we, we, we pay women different amounts for the same work as men. You think that's an accident? Look, I, I'm proud to be in America. And we've made a lot of progress in my 68 years. I come from the deep south, and I watch young people, white and black, change the country's policy. I mean, Dr. Martin Luther King was 20-something years old when he led that revolution. So it's young people that I go to. I'm doing a college tour now. I'm not saying that young people are smarter than older people. I'm just saying they have more courage. They, they, they're unafraid. I, when I was in college, we marched against the Vietnam War and we stopped it. 59,000 dead American troops for no reason. And the young people stopped it. I think this issue will ultimately come down to young people. That's why I go to Occupy. I think young people have the courage. They're, they're not bought off. They're 
not hooked into a job so good that they couldn't give it up. So I'm hopeful that the inequities in our system, women have had the right to vote for 100 years. African Americans in the South for 40. That's how, that's how tough it has been to do this. I mean, I was proud to be a Republican, the party of Abraham Lincoln, because it was the Democrats who were segregationists. So I understand history in this country, and the history of this country is that it moves slow, and fairness is never number one. Profit is. We need to combine the two. We also need to uh, answer your question uh, about women and minorities. Uh, we need to open up our political system, and a lot of the reforms that we've talked about, particularly public funding elections, would do that, and it's proven to do it because we need many more kinds of people to be able to run for office, both on the state, local, national level, and participate. That's really what we need. That's what we need. And I think President Obama's proof of it. That's how he got his job. That's how he reached out. He reached across old wars and old wounds and old positions and brought hope to the field. That's what we need this time. And, and the play, I have three sisters. They run my life, let me confess that. So if they could be here today, they would do a much better job than I of telling you the power of a level playing field. Hi, um, Rob Weissman. I don't know if, if you were here when I asked a question of the audience, so I'll just repeat it and, and ask you, why should we go to all of that trouble for a constitutional amendment, all that time, money, and effort to take on that Herculean tax for uh, uh, an amendment that only reverses Citizens United. Why wouldn't we go for an amendment that fixes the whole system? Uh, I'm ready. So, Well, I'm not public campaign. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm a public citizen. Public citizen. I mean, I don't understand why. What don't you understand? I don't understand why why you would go for that that particular amendment. Which not an amendment to reverse Citizens United. That's. So the amendment that I think the, the I mean, I actually spoke about this. So yes, I mean, I'm asking you why. I, 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 I will answer it. You have to talk. Okay. So the answer to the amendment we don't support. I said specifically we don't support an amendment just to overturn Citizens United. There's a whole range of amendments. We're supportive of stuff that deals with the broad range of issues that, have, that are invoked by Citizens United, but there are a whole set of issues. We want to deal with an amendment that overturns Citizens United, that overturns the doctrine that, free, that money is speech, the Buckley v. Vallejo decision, and that goes after the problem of corporate person. So it would be a series of amendments? Well, okay. they're embodied. I mean, I, the specific amendment we favor is from, uh, from Senator Sanders and, and Representative Deutsch that does all that in one amendment. He wants you to add term limits. Governor Romer mentioned the uh, internet and social media, and we've got tweeting and live streaming going on all around us. Um, the money is in politics, basically for communication, getting the message out, whether it's positive, often negative. The question is, we're not quite there yet, but as we move into the 21st century, is there a possibility that the increased use of the internet and social media will make it possible to get that message out without spending so much money? And instead of getting money out, it will make it less and less relevant and be able to get the message out using this new media. And I'd, I'd like any of the panelists to, to comment on that. You know, uh, it, at American Sir Campaign Reform, we, we take the view that it's not so much getting money out of the political system because candidates need money to run for office. That's a reality. That's not inherently a bad thing. It's where it comes from. That's really, I think, the most important point. If you can shift the whole um, uh, focus of a, of a campaign system from wealthy donors and special interests to one driven by small donors with a public match, that's the kind of thing that could drive change. But I do agree with you. I think technology would very much aid that kind of process and allow, again, more people to run, open up the system. This is a more speech approach. That's why it's, it's needs to be voluntary, but it's also constitutional in terms of opening up the system and providing more voices. That's what we really need. 
Hi, my name is Sam. I'm with the uh, Anarchist Alliance DC and I'm also an Occupy DC uh, facilitator. Um, I, I'm glad that you uh, recognize the uh, corrosive and corrupting uh, nature of money in politics. Uh, but I was wondering if you were, uh, if you could maybe talk about uh, different changes to the system, such as implementing a more direct democracy or consensus model in the decisions that are made for the laws and uh, various things that are enforced in the country. <laughs> That's a tough question. Let me give you a, not maybe the direct response you want, but I think it's, a, it's, it's on point. So actually more decision making goes on, not in Congress, but in the executive branch, and particularly in regulations that implement legislation. The regulatory system is more captured by corporate interests than even the legislative process is, entirely because it's closed, specialized, and, and lobbyists down there. So there are actually tons of things that can be done to change the regulatory process, to open it up and make it much more inclusive, much more particular public participation, and to move away from a, a corporate, I mean, there's all kinds of special ends. There's an agency in the White House called OIRA, which basically serves as a, as a corporate check on any regulation that an agency might do. You can do all kinds of things to reform that, and, but we, it's gonna be very hard to get those reforms won until we deal with why we got the problems in the first place, which is all the corporate money and the political process. Let me add, Sam, let me add, Sam, that you're really on to something. There's so much work that needs to be done, but, but when you're facing a big problem, you have to start somewhere. Now, I agree with Steve that we need to look at reapportionment, we need to look at term limits, but I start with the money. I don't stop there. I start there, and, and as was said a moment ago by Rob, I'm not trying to take money out. I'm trying to reveal it, look at its sources, so we can judge as citizens who's financing what. But it goes much deeper than that. Do you know in this, this town is a rigged deal. The caucuses meet. When the Democrats had control of the House and the Senate, they were in total control of this town a few years ago. President, House, Senate. They had Democratic caucuses that were closed to the people, closed to the press. They still have them in this town. The two parties have caucuses that are closed to the news media. And yet, a party controls the Congress and they can shut the public out. I mean, it is this kind of of warping of our republic and our democracy that has happened so long in this town that the people here think that's normal. That is not normal and that is not healthy. So Sam, this is just the beginning. We have a lot of work to do in this republic. Stacey Bridges, I'm a native of Northern Virginia and a victim of a corruption here in Washington, D.C. A 30-day sample of a vilify killed my fiancé in 30 days. Today we have schizophrenic drugs that are being advertised and mass marketed on national TV, all because a lobbyist or some special interest gave a politician some money. People are dying now. You mentioned uh, criminal charges. These corporations want to be treated like citizens, yet they don't want the accountability. Charles Manson is in jail today for murders that he didn't commit, his followers committed. They're committing mass murders on a grand scale. Is there anything that you can think of to do to overturn not only Citizens United, but to get those schizophrenic drugs to warn the American people so they're not giving it to their kids with ADHD, autism, Alzheimer's, PTSD, you name it. Well, let me respond only because I've been an elected official in my past. Uh, and, and it's what we're fighting for here. Without the specifics of your question, let me broaden it to all of our questions. The only way in a country we love to make changes and get things done and keep up with our children's dreams is to have the people be heard. I, I don't know any other way to do it. And I'm telling you, you live in a country now where the people are not heard. Do you think any politician cares what the voters think generally compared to what the big checks think? It's corrupt when you live in a town where at the head of every line is the biggest check. And a woman with a good idea, a family with a dream that could put America to work, 
They are forgotten. I'm telling you, the older I get, the more I realize the danger of silence. And what I'm trying to do is to get you to speak up. Keep giving that speech. Keep asking that question. And what I'll do is try to keep opening the doors. I like to do health care, not with lawyers, lobbyists, big hospitals, and insurance companies, but with nurses, patients, and doctors. That would be a different health care. Uh, my name is Shepard, and I'm from Occupy Philadelphia, as well as Philly Root Strikers. Um, while we we're engaging in a number of different strategies and tactics you guys have all have, uh, touched upon, one of the things that I haven't heard about is single issue voting. Um, it was used in Prohibition, actually, to drive the uh, amendment to outlaw alcohol, and it actually is a major factor in potentially unifying both parties, as we've talked about, in electing or at least voting for a specific candidate that will um, put on his platform getting money out of politics. And that people will vote only for a candidate that supports that, regardless of what their platform is, regardless of their party. Yet I continually hear nothing mentioned about that. Well, I mean, well, I mean, well, I would comment, <laughs> but it's, it's self-serving for me to comment on that. I announced a year and three months ago that after 16 years out of politics, I was going to run for president. And that I would accept no donations over $100, no PAC money. I'm the only congressman that never received PAC money. Tip O'Neill used to laugh at me. How do you get elected, buddy? Easy. I'm the only governor to ever get elected without PAC money. I have said that this is my issue. There are other important issues, but it starts with this one. So I would love for America to decide for one four-year period Let's get this right, and then we'll elect a politician. All right, well, let's thank everybody. I think that we're going to come up and ask questions. The participation is awesome. So I'm going to turn it back over to see. So I'd like to thank you again, uh, for all the speakers for coming out this morning. Um, so a lot of